Amen. Thanks for that. Let's turn to the book of Jude together tonight. Book of Jude. I've really enjoyed this in-depth study of this book. Power-packed book. Lots of Bible areas to cover when we look at Jude. But I think we've probably only got two more messages, including tonight. Let's read verse 14. Through 21. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, Walking after their own lusts and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And now we're going to Change gears. Verse 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And we'll stop right there. You could call the, the first section of the book up until tonight, up until we get to probably verse 1 through verse 2 through verse 19, you could probably call that watch yourselves. And now we could go into keep yourselves. Watch yourselves that you don't get into this trouble. Keep yourselves out of trouble and uh, build your faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. We have this challenge here, but ye beloved. In other words, contrast. Everything we saw before all these different kinds of people that would go into sin and, and walk after their own lusts and be murmurers and complainers and, and always taking things for granted and drawing people after themselves and trying to you know, build a name for themselves. He says, I want you to be a contrast to all that. I want you to be aware that they're out there. I want you to make sure that you check yourselves, that you don't end up with that kind of spirit. And this is what I want you to do. But ye, beloved... Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Build. So this is how we fight these spirits. This is how we fight these attitudes. This is how we fight this present world. It is an active approach to our faith. Build. Build. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Christians, we need to commit to building ourselves. Amen. Amen. And so this means we are responsible for our own spiritual growth. Once you, now, you can't grow without Jesus Christ. Don't get me wrong. This isn't a, I can make myself a, a, a better person and I can become good enough so that God saves me. None of that. No, no, no. You had to come broken. You had to be the prodigal son. You had to come to yourself. You had to confess your sin. And you had to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And you had to believe on him, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And you believe that. And guess what? You were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you were given gifts. You were given the word of God, and now there's an expectation that you're going to actively work and make choices that will help you build up your own faith, your own spiritual growth. It means we cannot wait around and just hope that some spiritual growth happens in between the busy times. We can't expect others to make us grow. At the church, I mean, we want to make sure that we're preaching good doctrine. We want to make sure that we're giving you uh, good music and good fellowship times and good service opportunities. A church can give you an environment to help you grow in, but you've got to desire spiritual growth for yourself. And then you've got to take responsibility for your own spiritual growth. And then you've got to pick up God's building blocks and use God's mortar and build your faith God's way. Amen. Building yourselves. The scriptures here put the challenge on the believer, the responsibility on the believer. 
And, you know, as parents, we often try to do a lot for our kids. But ultimately, we, what we learn as they grow older and as we all grow older is every individual just has to want it for themselves. And it's good that we try to provide, you know, spiritual environments. But ultimately, someone that wants the Lord Jesus is going to grow despite their, if they're in a bad environment, they're going to grow despite their environment. And if they don't want the Lord Jesus, they can be in a perfect environment and they'll never grow because it still deals with the heart of the individual. So there are obviously some key verses in the Bible we know about growth. I'll have you turn to one tonight, Matthew 7. About building. In a way, Jude kind of follows Matthew 7. We've got the verse 15, the beware of the false prophets. And we've got a, a good tree brings forth good fruit. A corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. We've got a people that say, Lord, Lord, look at me. Look at all the good things I've done. And he'll say, I never knew you. We get down to verse 24 and Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and do with them. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Applying the word of God to your life is how we build our faith. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. That's right. A life where you've built up your own sort of self-righteousness and you've built your own life without any thought to God. That's the building on sand because the storm's coming. Both of these people have to face the storm, but only one house stands. And that's the house that's built on the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ built on his word. Everyone is building. Everyone is building. You're building a life. Are you building a life that will survive the storms? We got young people here. Young people. Build a life that will survive the storms. Build your most holy faith. Build on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. All other ground is sinking sand. Because uh, if you're building anywhere else, you're building on sand. You're building, and it might look good right now, but it's just another tall apartment building on the sinking sands of the foundation of the world. And when the rains come, it will fall. 1 Corinthians 3. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. You've got to look out where you're building, and you've got to look out how you're building. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones. Those are the good three. Wood, hay, stubble. Those aren't the good three. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of how much it is. No, it's of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Praise the Lord for the rest of the verse. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This is called the judgment seat of Christ. We realize right now we are building. We're all building. And so now that you've trusted Christ, you've stopped building on sinking sand. And you're building the foundation. Now the problem is, is you've got to be careful what you're building, how you're building. If you're building the stuff that will last 
the stuff unto the Lord, then that's going to be tried by fire and survive for eternity. That's going to be wonderful. The problem is, is all the other stuff we're building, wood, hay, stubble, the wasted stuff, the vain stuff, the worldly stuff, the sinful stuff. And that gets tried by fire and that gets burned up and we could suffer eternal loss. But praise the Lord for God's eternal security. We'll be saved by fire. So I looked up a simple article. How do I build my faith? And this article was great. It gave me nine points. I added a couple. I'm just going to read these off. These are, these are common sense, simple ways to build your faith that we should all know. But knowing something and doing something are two different things, right? So we got to make sure we're continually challenging us. How do I build my faith? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible tells us to read, know, and meditate on Scripture. The Bible is the most relevant and powerful for building unshakable faith than anything else. You can watch videos. You can watch conservative commentators and philosophers, and they have some interesting things to say. Uh, usually they're stealing it from God's wisdom of Proverbs, and I probably should have just read Proverbs anyway. But uh, this is where we learn truth. This is where we learn falsehood, and we get warnings and from the word of God, we can build our faith. Number two, worship God. Truly worship God. Worship is a proclamation that God is infinitely worthy, infinitely holy, true, and good. And so we set God on a pedestal and we bow before that pedestal in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives in worship. Though, if you study the ancient words for worship, you're talking about bowing down on your face or you're talking about kissing the ring like you would in a Lord vassal sort of situation where you have to come in and get on your knees before the king and swear fealty to the king. That's, those are all the ideas of worship. Certainly not a rock concert. That's a new made up version of worship. Prayer, honest prayers, real prayers. Your faith will never be strengthened when you're holding back on God. And so we've got to pray by faith. And our prayers have to be more than a wish list. And our prayers have to be more than a laundry list of health stuff. We have to really pray that God works in our lives and in the lives of others. We have to confess in our prayers our sins and, and confess our failings and confess our deepest desires and and we have to trust that God cares and knows and we have to develop prayer lives. Placing our identity in Christ, owning up. See, that's, you could call that baptism, right? Baptism is identifying with Christ. But also in this world, as we walk through this world, we need to, to identify with Christ publicly and need to let people know we're Christians and we believe something truly in, in, in the core of our hearts. We believe in Christ. We have to identify with him publicly and that's scary at first but you know what when you start doing it it gets easier and easier to do and you find your faith strengthened more and more unite with saints come together with saints that's that's the church right that, that could also be fellowships uh, satan wants to have us alone and bitter and sad and crying in our rooms god wants us together and united and joyful and serving and singing and praying and Praising, amen. Unite with saints. So make efforts to grow. That's kind of redundant when we're talking about building our faith because we're talking about growth. Uh, I like this one. Take a break from the news and social media. You know, have you found that that stuff actually gets you wired sometimes and a little bit angry? <laughs> there are actually studies that show a direct correlation between social media overuse and unhappiness. Turn it off. Um, meditate on your salvation. I like that. We've got a lot of verses in the Bible that tell us to remember. And I want to apply that to my salvation. Remember uh, the pit that God dug you from and the rock that he put your feet on and how he's brought you along. And, and just meditate on what it means to be saved, what it means to have eternal life. Uh, I'm going to add some things not in your article. I guess I said identify with Christ, but share your faith. Share your faith. These are building blocks. These will help build your faith. Serve others. Do purposeful service for others in Jesus' name. That's the, the cup of cold water verses. That's a purposefully going out of your way to do something for someone else 
in Jesus' name. All these things are ways to build our faith. Amen. Build. Let's go back to Jude. Careful where you build, careful how you build. Building your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, we're not in a southern meeting where we talk about praying him in. He done showed up. We prayed him in. We sang him in. I get it. Sometimes people feel happy. But what I'm talking about here is praying in the will of the Holy Spirit. That's what the scripture is talking about. You know, we often we, we pray, you know, God heal this person, right? And that's, you know, we hear someone's sick. There's someone we care about. So we say, God, heal them, right? And I'm not saying to not pray that way. But maybe with a little spiritual discernment, you, you, you might think about it. You might pray a little bit. You might realize this person's really been struggling with their faith. This person really, they, they might not even be saved. They haven't been in church in, in years. I don't know that God healed them right away is praying according to the will of the Spirit. Maybe they need to suffer a little bit so that they will be broken and humble themselves and seek God and get saved. I, I don't know. So that's why we want to seek the will of God in our prayers and the, you know, praying in the harmony of the Spirit with the will of God. The Spirit is one of the three persons of the Godhead. He knows God's will for us. And so I have this one quote from C.S. Lewis that I like. Prayer in the Spirit is prayer whose supreme object is the glory of God. So what we want when we pray about something is God's glory. Not necessarily the answer that helps us the most in the moment, but ultimately God's glory. And only in a secondary sense is it a blessing for ourselves or for others. Primarily, we want to pray that God's glory, God's name be glorified. This is not natural for us. Instinctively, we look out for ourselves. Uh, the natural tendency is to be more concerned with our own interests and glory. The Holy Spirit will help us in this weakness when we ask Him to, and will impart the motivation to shift our center from self to the glory of God. Praying in the Holy Spirit also means we're working on our holiness. We're ensuring that when we go to prayer, we're not in the place of grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. So takes praying in the Holy Spirit takes all these ideas. I'm working on my holiness. I'm looking for God's glory as I pray. We've got building. We've got praying. And I really like this one in verse 21. Verse 20 is build yourselves. Verse 21 is keep yourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keeping ourselves in harmony with his ever-present truth and love. Following God's path is how we keep ourselves in the love of God. We start to get off the path. We start to get our eyes and our heart on other things. We're no longer centered in God's love. We're allowing ourselves to, to veer out of his best for us, out of his love for us. The place of blessing, the place of faith, the place of obedience, the place of service. These are all the places where we're going to experience the fullness of God's love. The place of self is where we're getting ourselves out of God's love. It's, kind of like living like you're on the dark side of the moon. The sun is always there. The sun is always shining. But someone on the dark side of the moon are never in a position to enjoy the sunlight. And we can take ourselves out of the position of God's love. Example of this is the prodigal son in Luke 15. He was always loved by his father. But for a time... He could not experience or benefit the love of the Father because of his choices. Turn with me to Proverbs 4. I'm 
Let's read verse 20 to 27. My son, attend to my words and incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Here's how we keep ourselves in the love of God. We keep our hearts. And how we keep our hearts is attending unto the words of our Heavenly Father and, and making sure that we're doing the right kind of maintenance. We're watching the path of our feet. We're pondering our choices. Is this choice for the glory of God or is this just something I really want? You know, and so we're, we're constantly in this self-checks place. And I see, I understand without the Spirit of God, you can't build your faith. Without the Spirit of God, you can't keep yourselves in the love of God. But for believers, I see several verses in Scripture that put the responsibility on us to keep ourselves in the right place. Amen? That's the challenge I see in Proverbs 4. That's the challenge I see tonight from, from Jude. We keep our eyes in the right place. Oh, let's look at how he finishes verse 21. Looking for, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we're going to stop there tonight. What, what helps us is our eyes in the right place. We're looking for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming. And we want to make sure that we're ready when he comes, that we have the room all swept and clean. We have the table set. It's ready to go for when he comes to the door. Amen. And so that's, uh, you know, Jesus, his sacrifice, his death, his burial, his resurrection is the past. But we also want to keep our eyes on our present relationship with him day by day. And then we want to make sure that we are fulfilling his desire for us in the here and now. But then we also want to make sure that we have an eye towards the future, the immediate future, the expectation of the sons of God, the coming of our Savior. And so basically I'm saying, yes, we give our past, our present, and our future to the Lord and that will help us build our faith and keep ourselves spiritually in the right place. Amen? Amen. That's all I've got tonight. God bless.